Just hope to here, so I'm going to be filling in for him. Uh, Matthew Fent, one of his PhD students. And uh, we're going to be talking about avatars, their evolution, and social implications. But first, uh, let's kind of go over what we're going to be learning today. So yeah, if you're all taking notes, at the end, hopefully you should be able to answer these questions. So uh, be able to define an avatar, list the three degrees of avatar freedom, uh, compare and contrast some of the different features of avatars, um, explain how avatars are frequently hypersexualized, and discuss the relationship between the player and avatar, decide if gender really is a cosmetic attribute or maybe something more, conclude whether the evolution of avatars, where they'll go from here. So, And the number uh, next to it is uh, kind of not important. It refers to the level of Bloom's taxonomy we're going to be discussing. So if you know anything about that, great. Otherwise, um, just it kind of shows that we're going to be covering a, a whole range of subjects. So, Avatar. So, I'm obviously not talking about this one or this one, but rather something like um, this or this or this. But first, what are they? Um, anybody recognize this game? Really old game. Gunfight from 1975 had a very um, simple but unique avatar. I guess you're the guy on the left there. Um, once we start showing the representation of the avatar, it kind of takes on um, a different kind of meaning to the player, and we're kind of going to discuss that. So first, who wants to tell me what they think an avatar is? I'd say essentially anything that represents you inside of the game. OK, good. Anybody else have any thoughts? Okay, so yes, um, a character in a game who serves as a protagonist under the player's control. And it originally comes from the Sanskrit term for like the bodily incarnation of a god. And that's really appropriate when we're talking about video games, right? Um, you are kind of the god that controls the flow of the game and uh, all your power is instilled in this character. Um, so let's discuss kind of the levels of avatar freedom ranging from very constrained to least constrained. So the most constrained level of avatar freedom is avatar selection. Um, this refers to a very simple selection of your character. Um, it has perhaps little to do with the actual gameplay. You select your character and then you're good to go. So um, in Mario Party, I, that's my picture there, as far as I know, the selection of the character doesn't have a lot of effect on gameplay. Perhaps some of the, the newer versions do. But um, you still select you know, Mario or Luigi or whoever you want, and uh, you're good to go. There's no um, kind of choosing Mario's hair color or um, what items he has, uh, just the bare bones selection. And moving up from that, we have avatar customization. So that's at the bottom left there. We have a picture of Gran Turismo 5. Um, you do a little more than just select your car. Um, you can select your car. It has different attributes. You race it. Uh, you might win some money to unlock, like uh, fancier tires or a uh, different paint job. They might actually even have some impact on the game. Um, and finally, the most uh, freedom you can have in a character is the construction of the character. So, uh, anybody recognize that game at the bottom right? Uh, yes. So, um, I, 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 yeah, it, I don't know if it's Mass Effect 1 or 2, but it's one of those. Because of the profile reconstruction, they didn't have that in 2. <laughs> All right, we got a Mass Effect player over here. But if you can see that, um, we're. Uh, able to customize the eye shape, the, the depth, kind of like the lip height. Um, and you know, that's all just in one tiny menu. You know, we can talk about the, the nose shape and height and everything. Um, really, you have a lot of freedom. But it's not only in these um, uh, kind of role-playing games that we have avatar construction. Um, you can kind of make your character from scratch in like the Mii uh, for your Wii. And, your avatar for Xbox Live. So there's some kind of appeal to be able to um, get down and make your character from scratch. And we'll discuss that a little more later. So different features of avatars now. Uh, functional versus cosmetic attributes. So 
uh, functional attributes, these have the effect on the game. So when I was talking about the uh, kind of tires in Gran Turismo, your selection will have some impact on the game. So uh, if people are familiar with the stats in Dungeons and Dragons, you have things like intelligence, constitution, strength. These all impact your character's performance. And not only that, but interestingly, it impacts the way you play the game. So if you have a lot of strength, you can be like up in the front line attacking monsters. But if you're low on strength and you have a lot of magic or whatever, you may be in the back casting fireballs. So not just an effect on how well you play the game, but shapes the way your actual gameplay uh, evolves. Um, and then we have cosmetic attributes. So these have no in effect on the game. So um, the height of your nose does not determine whether you save the world or not. But um, it makes the game fun at a low implementation cost. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Yes. Why, why do you agree? As much fun as it can be to have a character that's well-defined and who he is, but I mean, what it is is that having him look like you want to and act how you want to can do it. I mean, like Mass Effect, you know, what you looked like in the game had no impact on your storyline choices, but it like made it much more interesting because you could say, I want my guy to be, you know, well, I want him to be an Asian and just be really short or something. Mm -hmm. And what were you saying? Uh, you spend probably, what, about a third of the conversation uh, looking at your character, so I guess it's best if you make it look, make it something you want to look at. Right. Sure. Anybody else have any thoughts? So, cosmetic uh, attributes, a good thing to add. And really, uh, you don't need to play test whether having the ability to move your char the character's nose will break the combat system. It requires a lot less, um, you know, play testing and implementation, but the players will love it. You know, you can spend forever making your character. And in fact, is anybody familiar with the Spore character creator? Yeah? Um, so for those of you that aren't, Spore is this kind of um, like God simulation. You make a race of an alien and you start from the cellular level and you can evolve your race all the way up to um, like flying in a spaceship. And before the game was actually released, they released this character creator, which was only a very tiny portion of the game where you make the physical form of your character when he's like, a, like an animal size. Um, and you could have him have like three eyes or um, make some kind of uh, bizarre looking monster. No gameplay involved, just this character creator. People bought this. Um, now there was the expectation that the, the game was coming later, but um, you know, you can entertain yourself for a very long time just making your character. People like it. Um, so now let's get to an interesting question. Do you think that the character's gender is a functional or cosmetic attribute in most games? It depends on the game, I guess, because in some games you'll actually change your stats, whether you're male or female. Okay. But then in others, it's just what you want to look like. Can you think of a, a game where your, your gender influences your attributes? Um, I think some of the MMOs, it might be like Final Fantasy XIV or something. But Definitely some of the MMOs, you get like more wisdom for being female and less strength, basically. Okay. There's a difference of one point between strength and agility, I think, but whatever. Um, Mass Effect kind of blurs the line, because for most of the game it's cosmetic, but then you have the whole romance subplot. That changes completely if you go female or make male. Right. So obviously, um, if you have an RPG, the storyline may change, but um, and that's... I don't think people really have a problem with that. You kind of um, have that expectation when you choose your character. But I'm really thinking about um, the gameplay. Is, the, is a combat easier or harder if you have a female or male character, or is it easier or harder to cast spells? Um, the book that I did my research on here suggests that you make uh, your gender a cosmetic attribute. But whether the stats actually change or not, um, your game experience may change, especially on MMOs, which we'll talk about later. So keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so specific versus nonspecific. 
characters. Um, there's this kind of a continuum. It's hard to tell um, where the one begins and the other ends, although there are some that are definitely um, more specific than the others. So a very non-specific character. Um, your character in text adventures. This is Zork, the, um, one of the first text adventure games. And uh, there's no character description. There's no complicated backstory for the character. And in fact, um, I don't think this one does it, but some text adventures ask for your, your gender at the beginning just so they don't get he and she mixed up. So there's very little um, character back knowledge. Uh, kind of going up the continuum a little bit, we've got Gordon Freeman and Half-Life. You never see Gordon Freeman. There are no mirrors in the game. Um, it kind of like cheats a little bit because you see his picture like on the, the box of the game. But and, in line, and online. Yeah. Um, again, there's, there's little backstory about what, what his relationship is to other characters. I mean, there's a little bit of plot, but Basically, for non-specific avatars, they are you. Um, they're your manifestation in the game. Like in uh, the Sanskrit, you know, they're the bodily incarnation of a god. Um, now, kind of getting up the continuum to specific characters, um, the book I talked about referenced uh, Amy Ryan. Has anybody ever heard of that? Apparently, she's a very... Um, uh, interesting character in this obscure game that I had never heard of. So I put up Monkey Island. Are people more familiar with Monkey Island? Yeah. Ever heard of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a, uh, it was a pretty big deal with point and click adventures. It kind of pioneered a lot of um, different interesting things about video games. It's very hilarious, I think. It's half the reason it did so well. Because a lot of text adventures and games in general took themselves very seriously, whereas, this, whereas Monkey Island as a series just said, Let's just throw all that out the window and just make a I comedy a, point and click touch. adventure. Right. Uh, so, uh, getting back to the point and click adventure, uh, Guybrush is your character here. And you are not really Guybrush. You kind of control him, you kind of guide his actions, but he has his own personality, he has his own backstory. Um, I'm not, I don't know the particulars, but I assume that if you tell, try to tell him things that he can't do, he'll tell you, um, no. I can't do that, or oh, I can't go over there, or something like that. <coughs> um, so that's not really your manifestation. It's kind of a character in his own right. So, direct control versus indirect control. Mario, you push the joystick or the buttons, he goes left or right, you push A, he jumps, you control his every motion. Um, getting back to point and click games, uh, Monkey Island, and um, you know, there's the more generic get out of the room kind of games. You can't control every action. You click you know, left and your character will make his own way to the left. Maybe you'll have to jump over a box or something like that. But um, you don't guide his every movement. You can click like, um, I don't know, the stairs and he'll walk up the stairs. But again, you kind of guide his action as opposed to control every motion. So. Just as kind of a recap here, what is the relationship between the player and the avatar? So Gordon Freeman or in the text adventures, that, that is you. There's no other real um, uh, story or physical representation. Um, it's you in the game. Mario, he's kind of a representation of you, right? You guide his every action, but you can kind of see him. Remember when I talked about gunfight? Um, you can kind of see your avatar and... Uh, that kind of changes your relationship with him. You kind of recognize him as his own kind of person. And Guybrush, he's kind of a person in his own right. Um, he has his own uh, you know, desires, or he can refuse an action if uh, he thinks it's dangerous or something like that. So we kind of have the whole continuum here. So let's talk about hypersexualized avatars. Anybody want to give me some stereotypical hypersexualized uh, avatars? There's a really obvious male and a really obvious female, I think. Female night elves. Okay, Laura. good. Any other thoughts? Duke Nukem and Laura Croft. Yes, all right, good. Those were the ones I was going to go with. Um, so, 